Amen. And so we have a reader this morning. Come on out, Moses. Yeah, we got Moses. Okay. <laughs> Moses is here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Moses, and today I'm going to be reading Luke, Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 9. 39. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. He told them this parable. This parable, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine, one after drinking old wine, wants the new for they say the old is better. Come on, let's give God some praise for Moses. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Amen. Amen. So somebody say, out with the old, in with the new. Can I get my uh, first, <clears throat> first scream? Can you guys see that? Well, I'm sorry. Okay. Out with the old, in with the new. Here's my big idea. It says... Since we are followers of Christ, there is no need to hunger for the old. Because in Christ, we are nourished and refreshed for or by the new. I'm going to say that again. Since we are followers of Christ, there is no need to hunger for the old. Because in Christ, we are nourished we are fed, we are refreshed by the new. Out with the old, in with the new. Okay, Luke chapter 5 is where we're at. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles, your electronic devices open to that. And as we go through this text, we're going to find out what God is saying about the old and the new. So what's going on here is that there's a new preacher in town, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's been baptized. He first got baptized. And, and, and at his baptism, he had some special guests. His father in heaven, God Almighty, spoke at his baptism. And then the Holy Spirit made his appearance in bodily form and, and, and alighted upon him like a dove. And so some new things was already happening at the outset of his ministry. So here this Jesus Christ, the new preacher, he's going around teaching in the synagogues and preaching. And then he's healing miraculously, so much so that he's gaining a following. And people are following behind him, bringing their sick, and he's healing them miraculously, like I said. And, and then not only is he preaching and teaching and healing, he's also gathering, as Pastor Derek said the other week, he's gathering himself a community group, okay? And he's gathering all these people that, that maybe some people don't want to be around, the fishermen, because they're, they're not learned. And then he's gathering the tax collectors. If you can rem remember, the tax collectors would cheat people. And so he's gathering these different people from all over the community that maybe the church
people or the religious people might look down on. He even has a person that we find out later that stabs him in the back that by the name of Judas. But he's put together his little community group of 12 people and he calls them his disciples his followers. And so, like I said, the church people, they looking around trying to see what's going on because he's doing things that are outside of the norm. He's doing things that are non-traditional. And so they're following him and they're trying to catch him doing something so they can ask questions, so they can inquire, so they can trip him up. So what we find before we get to this passage is that he's called the tax collector to be his disciple. The name is Matthew. Matthew invited him to a banquet. And while they were eating at the banquet, some of these church folks or Pharisees wanted to know why was he eating with sinners. Amen. And so, like I said, they're following him around, trying to trip him up. Now, when we get to our passage, now they want to know why is his disciples not fasting like the rest of them? Amen. Out with the old and in with the new. So let's look at verse 33 and just see what Jesus is going to say about this. Verse 33 says, And they, meaning the Pharisees, and they said to him, The disciples of John fast often, that's John the Baptist, and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. He's, they said, but yours eat and drink. The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. Can you put my slide two up on the screen? So here's my first point. It says, don't allow others to place you in their old traditional mindset, okay? Don't allow others to place you in their old and traditional mindset. So I started off talking about New Year's Eve. And so what happens on New Year's Eve is that a lot of us have certain traditions, right? We, do you? Like I said, when I was a kid, my mom didn't allow us to go out. So we would stay at home and we would watch Dick Clark and we would eat hors d'oeuvres and, and things like that and play cards. And then when I had children, I didn't allow them to go out either, but we would go to church service to watch night. That was our tradition. Somebody here may say, well, we went to parties. Somebody else might say, well, we drank champagne. Somebody else might say, we will wait till the countdown. And to this very day, y'all, I still wait for the countdown. When we had it the other night here at church, I probably was the loudest one here. That's my tradition. So what is a tradition? A tradition is usually a custom. It, it's something that, that you do all the time. It, it's a practice. It's a doctrine. But one thing about traditions is that some traditions, some people don't want to let go of. Right? They don't want to let go. They don't want to change. They want to resist new things. But what we want to learn today is that some change could lead to growth. Some changes lead to growth. Some change could be God working a new thing in you. So we're going to look again at this group, the Pharisees, the church people, the disciples, the followers of Christ, and we're going to see how some change is good and some people don't want to let it go. Okay, so we're not going to allow other people to place us in, our old, in their old traditional mindset. And I don't know if some of you know, but for the first time in the history of the church, we've ordained deacons. The church has never had deacons, and it probably has to do with tradition. And I'm sure the new deacons by now, some people are already trying to put them in their old traditional mindset. Amen. Come on, y'all can be honest. As a woman preacher, some people often try to put us, me, in their old traditional 
mindset. I can remember a few years ago, we went to a church of a different denomination, and I don't believe that they believed in women preachers, right? So we get to the door, and for some reason, the usher asks me, was I a missionary? Me being my lovely, honorary self, I knew where she was going. I said, no, my name is Pastor Karen, and I'm an elder. Man, that just rocked her world. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know where to sit me. She knew she couldn't take me to the pulpit. She knew she couldn't take me to the right wood missionaries. She didn't know what to do. She was fumbling over her words. And then I just thought, let me, let me let her off. I said, you know what, ma'am? It's okay. I'll sit. At, and I took the back row at the back of the church. And the reason I did that is I'm not going to allow people to lock me into their old traditional mindset. I'm not going to get frustrated or mad or angry or even hurt. Because you know why? Because now, if you go to that same denomination, they are beginning to license women, not only as ministers, but as pastors. Because God is trying to do a new thing. And if we're still holding on or allowing people to lock us into this old stuff, then we're going to be stuck. Amen. So we are followers of Christ, and there's no need to hunger for the old. Let's look at that word fasting. Fasting. In the Hebrew and the Greek, the term fasting really comes from the root word hunger. Yeah, it, it means to abstain from food. It, it's also a religious discipline. It means to self-deny. It, it's also a sign of mourning. It, it's an attitude of repentance. It can be done for a confession or intercession. But guess what, y'all? This passage ain't really about fasting. Not really. Not at the core. But the, but the Pharisees are using fasting to, to try to get at Jesus Okay, so he said, they're saying, John's disciples are fasting, and we're fasting, but your disciples, here's what, see what they say, are eating and drinking. So I started thinking, I think they're hungry, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think they're hungry. One thing we know about the Pharisees is that they're very, very uh, ritualistic. They're, they're, they're very, they, they want to do things for show. So they would fast twice a week. And then they would walk around looking hungry and looking like they fasting. Right? They wanted everyone to know that they were holy or at least to think they were holy. They would set high standards that even they couldn't meet. So I think that they were concerned about Jesus' disciples eating and drinking because they were hungry. And I don't mean a physical hungering. I don't mean a stomach growling, craving for some chicken wings, hungry. <laughs> I mean a spiritual hungering for the things of Christ. And what's so interesting is that if we not allow people to, to place us in their, our, their old traditional mindset, then Christ, as followers, Christ is wanting and is feeding us and refreshing us. Remember, they said your disciples are eating and drinking. They're being fed. They're being full. And I don't mean with food that we think of, but with spiritual things. They're being fed, fed from the bread of life. A songwriter said it like this, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. I believe uh, Jesus' disciples were being fed and refreshed for the newness and the new things 
in Christ. So, we don't need to hunger for our old things when we're in the presence of Christ. That's my second point. If you can put that on the screen. I don't know if you guys can see it, but, but since I typed them up, <laughs> I typed them up, so we're going to put them up there. There's not a need to hunger for our old ways. There's not a need to hunger for our old ways. Let's look at verses 34 and 35. And Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. So what Jesus is alluding to is that not that he's against fasting, but fasting must be done for the right reason. So he's using a metaphor. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> He's using a metaphor of a wedding to, to, to explain a spiritual truth that there's not a need to hunger when we're in his presence. There's not a need to hunger for our, our old ways when we are in his presence. So he's using this metaphor and he's saying basically that he's the bridegroom and his followers are a part of his bridal party. And we know those of us that have gone to weddings or even gotten married that a wedding is a joyous occasion. And I don't know of anybody that came to a wedding uh, fasting or mourning unless you had to pay for it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but other than that, We've coming because it's a joyous and it's a celebratory and it's a party going on and there's plenty of food. So what Jesus is using this metaphor to say is there's a time for fasting and my followers have no need to hunger, no need to be hungry because they're in my presence. So let's look at the biblical wedding celebration because I think it will help us a little bit better. So what happens at the beginning is that <clears throat> the bride and the bridegroom have go come into a covenant or a contract. Now remember Joseph and Mary were in a contract when she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. They weren't yet married, but they were in a contract because when he found out she was pregnant, he said, I'm going to divorce her. And so they, will, they come into a contract, and the only way to get out of it is through divorce. So the bride and the bridegroom, are first thing they do is they come into a contract or a covenant. And we know a contract in the legal sense is where a party of two or more come into an agreement, right? The second thing that happens is that the bridegroom comes to the bride's father's home and takes his bride in a processional back to his house. See, back then they partied, y'all, and they would party for days. So they were processional all the way back to the bridegroom's house. They might have been doing some line dancing, I don't know. They would have the whole party. He'd come get his baby, his boo, his sweet cakes, and then they were processional all the way back to his father's, to his house. And then when he got there, the third thing that happens is that the bridegroom's father would prepare a feast and the party would still go on. And, and it's said that, there, that a, a wedding feast lasted for days. So ain't no fasting and no mourning going on. Amen. So Jesus is using this metaphor to say there's not a need to hunger. And I add it for our old ways. So what are our old ways? Our old ways might be our old nature, our old flesh, our old mindset, our old thoughts, 
our old attitude, our old lifestyle, our old actions. When we're in the presence of God, there's no need, no need to hunger for those things. We should be in a celebratory attitude because he's feeding, he's nurturing, he's refreshing us. Out with the old, in with the new. As Christians, we're constantly in the presence of the Lord as we we're constantly in the presence of the Lord. As a matter of fact, when we give our life to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new, out with the old, in with the new. Yeah, we try to hold on to those old things too, don't we? We try to hold on to our old attitudes. When I was thinking when, we're, when I was talking about the New Year's resolutions, maybe some of you didn't raise your hand because you already went back to your old ways. <laughs> you already let go of that new thing that you was trying to do or change. But see, Jesus Christ, he's coming here this morning to let you know that he wants to give you a new attitude, a new lifestyle, a new walk, a new talk, a new song, a new name. He wants to give you some newness. And so we must let go of those old things. Yeah, we, we don't need to hunger for our old ways. Verse 36 and 39. We don't, can I get to the third slide, guys? Thank you. We don't need to hunger for those old things because we have, to, but we have to be careful that we don't try to mix the old with the new because sometimes it don't fit. Sometimes it don't fit, y'all. I know some of us know that. But here's, let's begin with verse 36. Jesus is telling a parable. So he gave them this metaphor, and now he's telling a parable. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. Okay? And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Well, verse 39, I'll just explain that right off the bat. That's for those that don't want to let go of the old because it's good. They don't want to get nothing new, so they hold on to the old. But here we see Jesus is using two parables to illustrate and instill a spiritual truth. Okay, out with the old, in with the new. So he's saying his teaching of the kingdom and the gospel message uh, it, it might be related to the patch from the garment or, or it might be related to the new wine. And he's saying the law or Judaism or the Pharisees could be related to the old garment and the old wineskin. And, and he's not trying to abolish the old. He's just here to the old. So let's look at old. What does it mean? It means ancient. It means worn or worn out. Y'all know some of our ways is worn and worn out, huh? <laughs> some, of time, some of us are sick and tired of our old ways because it's old and worn out, amen? So that's what, that's what old means in this context. So we're going to look at new. So new, newness. There's two types of newness. Hence, two parables, two types of newness. So let's look at the first parable, the one about the new garment. So, y'all you know, know I'm always talking to my class. So my class, when I looked up the word new in both the parables, they were two different Greek words. Y'all know what that means. That means I need to do a study, right? So I did. Amen. So the new garment, that newness, it really means new, but it means to replace, to replace 
So he's saying, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Think about it. If you had an old pair of worn, torn up jeans, would you go and buy a new pair of jeans and cut up, patch, and put it on the old ones? You would buy the new jeans to replace the old jeans. Okay? Okay? So we have to be careful that we don't try to mix the old with the new because sometimes it doesn't fit. The old jeans are worn out and they're torn. And if we were to get some new ones and, and cut them up, it just is downright stupid, actually. <laughs> okay? So, so newness to replace. Now, the new wine. The new and the new wine means new as in fresh, as in youth, as in has never been around. So this brand new wine, if you put some wine that has just freshly been made into an old worn out wine skin, what happens with new wine that's just been made is that it ferments and it expands. The wine skins come from animals. And so if you use an old one that's already been expanded and stretched and you put new wine in it, what happens is the new wine will expand even more and possibly tear or rip the wine skin. And then the wine spills out and it ain't no good, the wine skin or the wine. Okay? So it's new, it's fresh. It's never, it hasn't been around long. Okay, but so you put new wine in new wine skin so it can expand together. Okay, now, so what? Why do we care about that? Why do we care? Because we got to be careful not to mix the old with the new because sometimes it don't fit. So when Jesus comes into our life, he wants to replace our old ways. That newness, like the new garment, he wants to replace our old stuff with new stuff. Our old walks, our old lifestyles, our old way we do things with new stuff, new walks, new lifestyles. And then when he comes into our life and we're new Christians like babes, just like the brand new fresh wine, he has to, we have to have room to grow. And so the newness is either, uh, is, is two things. We're, we're getting a new life. We're getting a new lifestyle. But then we're brand new. The gospel is new to a new convert. And we need room to grow and room to expand. Now I'm always trying to help my children out because I truly believe that God has his hand on both of them and that he wants to do something new in them. But I'm trying to give them a lot of times my wineskin. You see, I've been in the game a little bit longer. So I've had room to expand, and my wine skin has begun to stretch and expand with me. And so I try to give them my wine skin and have them do the things that I think they should do. But they need their own wine skin because God wants to expand and stretch and do some things in their lives. See, that's why we have to be careful that we don't try to mix the old with the new because sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes God is trying to do something new and we're the hindrances. Yeah. If we look at our passage, the, the Pharisees were the hindrances. God was trying... God was sending down Jesus to do something new. He wasn't trying to get rid of the old covenant, but replace it with something new. Huh. And when he sends his Holy Spirit in a new convert, yeah, it's new to them and they need room to grow and expand. And so the old legalistic Judaism 
needed to be out. And the new gospel message needed to be in. The old ways of following the law needed to be out. And the new ways of following the Holy Spirit needed to be in. The old ways of working to try to be righteous before God needed to be out. But the new ways of being accepted by faith through grace needed to be in. Out with the old and in with the new. Out with works, in with faith. Out with living under the law, in with living under the Holy Spirit. Out with the old. And so when God is trying to do something new in us, those of us that's already given up on our new resolution, <laughs> we got to be flexible, right? We can't let everything get to us. If your new resolution was to come to church every week, then come to church every week. It don't matter if somebody makes you mad, frustrates you, say what you don't want to hear. You have to be flexible. Because in the stretching of the old wineskin, I'm sure there's some frustration in it. I'm sure it just isn't pliable like that. Amen. Amen. And so we have to be careful that we don't mix the old with the new because since we are followers, followers of Christ, there's no need for us to hunger for those old things because the Christ in us, he's feeding us and he's nurturing us for those things that are new. And so like I said in the beginning and in my prayer that when God is doing something new in us, things just get gooder and better. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's go back to the top, to verse 33. And you can put my, I think this is the fourth one, fifth one. <laughs> 33, it said, and they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? And so in Christ, like I said, he will provide nourishment and refreshment for the new things. Amen. We, we can't let others put us in their old traditional mindset. Uh, we can't hunger for the old. Uh, we, we have to be careful that we don't try to mix the old with the new. But what happens is Christ feeds us. He provides. He provides. In Christ, he provides. And so, we're going to look back at the eating and the drinking because uh, remember I said things get gooder and then things get better. So remember I talked about the, the wedding. Remember I talked about the wedding. And so at that time, Christ was using this, um, using this metaphor saying he was the bridegroom. And, and here's what I'm going to say to you. He was the bridegroom then. He's the bridegroom now, and he's the bridegroom to come. That's the gooder and the betterer. And guess what? The bridegroom is coming back again. Do you believe that? He's coming back again. He's coming back for the church. Oops, I mean the bride. And that's you and that's me, right? He's coming back for his bride. And remember I said how that was going to happen? Well, I said the first thing that happens is they enter into a covenant or a contract agreement. They're what's called betroth. And so in Romans 10 and 9, it says this to the, to the bride and the bridegroom. If you confess with your mouth and if you believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and here's the agreement, you shall be saved. Amen. So as the bride of Christ, we are in an agreement. We are betrothed to the bridegroom. And so what did I say the second thing that would happen? I said the bridegroom will come to the bride's home and they would processional their way all the way back 
to the bridegroom's home. Amen? Is that what I said? Is that what I said? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, amen, and with a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and guess what? The dead in Christ shall rise first, and after that we who remain will be caught up, and we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The bridegroom is coming back and he's coming to the home and he's getting his bride and taking them back with him. Amen. And the third thing I said was they were processional and party their way back to the bridegroom's home and the father will prepare a feast before them. Amen. Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. It says, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Oh, I don't know about you, but that's some good news. Out with the old and in with the new. I want to be with my bridegroom one of these days. Out with the old and in with the new. Come on, worship team. So John said in Revelation 21, he said something like this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Out with the old and in with the new. And I saw the holy city. Guess what? It was the new Jerusalem. And it was coming down from out of heaven from God. And it was prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband out with the old and in with the new. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Out with the old. Come on, somebody, in with the new. And guess what? He's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. And no, no more of that old death. Amen. No more of that old mourning. No more of that old crying. No more of that old pain. Out with the old and in with the new. Because the former or the old things have passed away. And guess what else? He said he was seated on the throne and he said, Behold, I am making all things new. Out with the old and in with the new. I grew up Baptist, and I remember the old saints would say something like this. They would say, I got a new home, and it's over in glory. And they would say, and it's mine, mine, mine. They, say, they would say, I got some new shoes, and they over in glory. And guess what? They're mine, mine, mine. I got a new robe. I got a new walk. I got a new talk. I got a new crown. I got, I got some new uh, shoes, I already said. I got a, a, a new walk, and I got a new road to walk on, and it's made of, of pure gold, and it's mine, mine, mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God some praises. <clears throat> let's give God some praises because we are followers of Christ. And so we, as followers of Christ, when we're in his presence, we're not going to hunger for those old things. But then if you're not in Christ, you, you can't let go. You can't. You have nothing to feed you, to refresh you. So there, I'm going to ask the ministers to come. So there might be somebody out there that has not entered into betrothal with the bridegroom. There might be somebody that hasn't accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. And I'm going to tell you now, you're going to battle with those old things. If you don't have them, he's not here to replace them. 
And so if there's somebody like that and you're not ashamed, come forward. Maybe there's somebody that is still bat battling with some of their old ways. And, you know, like I said, that the, those wine skins, the new wine expands and, and it just don't happen overnight. We need to have room to grow. It doesn't happen overnight. It, there, there's a process. Maybe you're still battling. Maybe you still don't even know what it is that God's trying to do new in you. And you just need prayer for that. I'm going to ask you to come forward. He, he wants to make all things new because as you see, there is a greater and there's something gooder on the other side. And we want to be there. We want to be there. Amen. So if you're, you need prayer, you want to give your life to Christ, whatever it may be, these ministers are here to pray with you.